Welcome. Um, my name is Radha Nandagopal. I'm the newest member of the Division of the Endocrine Faculty at Children's, so I haven't had the pleasure of meeting many of you. Um, but I do have the pleasure of giving one of your first talks after lunch, so hopefully this will keep you awake. So I have no financial or other conflicts of interest to disclose, but certainly could use help to pay off our med school loans. Um, the objectives of my talk today are obviously to teach you everything I can possibly teach you in 25 minutes about vitamin D, which is um, fairly impossible if you do a PubMed search on vitamin D. Just in the last year, there have been over 20,000 articles published. But what we'll try to do today is go over the effects of vitamin D, deficiency on calcium homeostasis and bone health, to be aware of the extraskeletal health effects, which I think is getting all the press these days about vitamin D deficiency, knowing the sources of vitamin D deficiency, recognizing the recent uh, AAP recommendations for sufficiency and being familiar with high-risk groups who we should be screening, and finally understanding the use of supplementation. So where are we going in this talk and how will we possibly cover this entire um, body of information? We'll talk a little bit about physio physiology and metabolism. We'll go into the clinical manifestations of vitamin D deficiency, including bone disease as well as extraskeletal health effects. We'll talk about the sources of vitamin D, good ones and bad ones, the causes of vitamin D deficiency, diagnosis and screening of vitamin D deficiency, which I know is becoming the bane of your existence in the pediatric clinic, and then finally supplementation. What should you use and how much? So you can't get away from a talk with an endocrinologist without a pathway, so I'll give you this one. And it's not nearly as complicated as some of the other ones I could have put up here. Um, basically, all you need to know from this is that sunlight causes the breakdown of 7-dehydrocholesterol into vitamin D3, which is metabolized by the liver to 25-hydroxy-D3, then metabolized again by the kidney to 125-dihydroxy-vitamin D. And that has a lot of effects throughout the body, including maintaining calcium homeostasis. Simultaneously, PTH is released in response to low calcium levels, and PTH works as well at the level of the kidney to increase 125-dihydroxy-vitamin D levels. All of these work in concert to increase calcium absorption at the level of the GI system. Of course, we can't forget dietary and supplemental sources of vitamin D2 and D3. D2 is plant-based, D3 is animal-based. Um, and those also work to increase calcium absorption at the level of the gut. So in vitamin D sufficient states, we actually absorb about 30% of our intestinal calcium. So that's pretty good. But in states of vitamin D deficiency, that absorption is down to 10 to 15 percent. And we also have decreased renal phosphate reabsorption. So that's a problem. So the compensatory mechanisms for hypocalcemia or relative hypocalcemia are an increase in PTH, an increase in calcium reabsorption at the level of the kidney as a result of PTH, an increase in 1-alpha hydroxylase activity, which is that thing that converts, the enzyme that converts 25-hydroxy vitamin D to 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, and then an increase in phosphorus loss in the urine. So the net effect of all this is that you have low calcium levels, low phosphorus levels, so you have a low calcium phosphorus product, and that has a number of effects on the bone. We've all seen rickets. Rickets is the failure of osteoid calcification in immature bones. Uh, so basically, uh, there's an abnormal organization of the cartilaginous growth plate. So as differentiation is occurring here, the ossification process that normally occurs as a child's bone grows doesn't occur correctly, and there's actually poor mineralization of the cartilage. In a mature bone, we call that failure of osteoid calcification osteomalacia. So pictured on your left is a uh, normal baby's hand, a normal toddler with very normal appearing radial and ulnar growth plates, normal appearing um, epiphyses throughout. On your right is a child with very clear rickettsial findings. You see the cupping of the radius, cupping of the ulna, fraying and splaying of the growth plates. And if you look closely, there's actually a relative osteopenia um, when you compare the two together. The laboratory findings in a child with rickets generally include hypophosphatemia, hypocalcemia to varying degrees, high alkaline phosphatase, which is um, a marker of bone disease, and a high PTH level. And the classic scenario that we see probably in your pediatrics office as well as in our endocrinology offices really is confined almost exclusively to the exclusively breastfed infant who has dark skin, who has limited or no sunlight exposure, 
Generally, we see these patients in the winter months or the spring months after they've been inside all winter, and often these patients are taking no vitamin D supplementation despite recommendations from pediatricians. So rickets generally comes in three stages. Early on, there may not be as many biochemical abnormalities that you would expect to see. Um, early on, you may have a normal calcium, a normal phosphorus. The alkaline phosphatase may be only slightly elevated. PTH is generally elevated, and 25-hydroxyvitamin D is low. That's what makes the diagnosis. The x-ray may not have specific rickettsial changes, but may just show osteopenia. Moderate and severe rickets everything just gets worse. You have hypocalcemia, worsening hypophosphatemia, an elevated alkaline phosphatase, and all of the other signs get worse. You also see much worse in the way of rachitic changes. I think the real interesting thing that's happened in vitamin D over the last few years is um, it's sort of sorting out some of its extraskeletal health effects. We've known for a while what it does for the bone. It's much, been much less clear what it does for other systems. It's clear now that vitamin D is implicated in a number of systems, including the skin, immunity, um, the central nervous system, cardiac, uh, cancer-related issues, as well as in the metabolic processes. Time magazine noted that the discovery of these extraskeletal health effects was probably a top 10 medical breakthrough, and Oprah Winfrey in 2010 said, my vitamin D deficiency caused my thyroid to underperform. I think we should go ahead and certify her in endocrinology. So the skin stimulates, um, we know that vitamin D stimulates keratinocyte growth. Topical vitamin D analogs are now being tried and used in psoriasis treatment. Vitamin D appears to modulate B and T cell function. It appears to be associated with the onset of type 1 diabetes, so deficiency associated with diabetes, with multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, asthma, and then acute respiratory infection, which I'll go into a little bit more briefly. In, in addition, um, CNS effects are really interesting. It's been postulated now that type 1, that, excuse me, schizophrenia and mood disturbances may have something to do with childhood type uh, vitamin D deficiency, and Alzheimer's and depression have also been shown to be related to vitamin D levels. Uh, in the cardiac realm, t vitamin D deficiency appears to be associated with hypertension, with um, increased incidence of myocardial infarction, with congestive heart failure, and with peripheral vascular disease. It's also associated, if that weren't enough, with breast, colon, prostate, and pancreatic cancers. It regulates cell growth and appears to enhance macrophage activity. And finally, near and dear to our hearts in endocrinology, it also appears to be associated with type 2 diabetes and the metabolic syndrome. And we know from several studies now that the incidence and prevalence of type 2 diabetes is now, it looks like it can be modified by supplementation with vitamin D and by sunlight exposure. So most of the studies that I just briefly mentioned are association studies. They don't demonstrate any causative evidence. They're really epidemiologic. But there are a few studies that do. There's a prospective study of healthy adults where vitamin D sufficiency appeared to reduce the risk of an acute respiratory infection by twofold. You can imagine that, what that would do to sick days at work and productivity. In a randomized study in adolescent African-American boys, it was shown that 2,000 units as opposed to 400 units daily of vitamin D appeared to reduce arterial wall stiffness, which is a marker of cardiovascular disease. And it also confirms something we've known for several years now, that body fat mass is significantly and inversely associated with 25-hydroxyvitamin D levels, only because adipocytes are known to sequester vitamin D. So even though one, a patient may have plenty of vitamin D in storage, they really don't have any that's usable. So clearly vitamin D does everything, and it also appears to release belly fat. So I know at this point you're wondering, where can I find this amazing vitamin? So one of the best sources of vitamin D is the sun, and that's historically where we've always gotten our vitamin D, but for a variety of reasons that we'll talk about, that's not probably the best way to get it these days. Dietary sources are very important. We'll go over those briefly. Breastfeeding is an important source of vitamin D for many children, and for many infants who are exclusively breastfed, but it's important to remember that it's actually not a good source of vitamin D. So while I'm extremely pro-breastfeeding, you should remember that your patients who are breastfeeding are probably not getting the, um, their infants enough vitamin D if they're not supplementing. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about supplements. So as we said before, sunlight's really important to convert that 7-D-hydrocholesterol from, vitamin, from um, the precursors of vitamin D into vitamin D3. 
It's interesting to note that most tissues and cells actually have a vitamin D receptor, so not just those involved in the bone and the skeletal system. And it's postulated that 200 to 2,000 genes may be directly or indirectly uh, controlled by that end product, 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. And some of the current big uh, names in the vitamin D field really feel that vitamin D was probably so important for our overall health that there was really no need to get it from anything but the sun. Pretty much all you had to do was walk out outside your cave and you would get vitamin D. Um, so how does this work? When you go out in the sun, what happens? When you're exposed to UVB irradiation, there's conversion of pro-vitamin D to pre-vitamin D. The melanin concentration, or your pigmentation, actually regulates the amount of UVB penetration. And, then that pr and, and it's thought that that's actually protective against skin cancer and then the photolysis of folate, which is important for spermatogenesis, neural tube development, and all those other important things. Skin exposure to UV is actually measured as the minimum erythema dose, so the dose at which the skin turns mildly red but doesn't burn. So if you expose the entire body to one MED, so you turn your whole body red without burning, you can release about 10,000 to 20,000 units of vitamin D into your circulation over 24 hours. It's pretty good. 40% um, exposure, so you wear some clothes, to about a quarter um, MED, you'll get about 1,000 units of vitamin D per day. So it's actually fairly efficient. So how much sunlight do we really need? UVB rays actually have a shorter wavelength than UVA rays, and they scatter early and late in the day. So the highest ratio of UVB rays, which are those rays that we need to get vitamin D, actually occur at solar noon. So the time when the sun is really at its zenith. And that's the only time you have enough UVB photons for skin production of vitamin D. And that really only occurs between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. in the summer, fall, and spring in these latitudes. So not at all in the winter. You're getting nothing. Exposure time in the southern U.S., which is kind of where we're located, to achieve about one MED in the summer. Pale skin, you need about four to ten minutes. This is not taking into account things like cloud cover and pollution. Dark skin, you need 60 to 80 minutes. But children, interestingly, may actually be somewhat more efficient at this, partly because they have a higher body surface area, and it's thought that they may actually do this whole process a little bit more efficiently. So a fully clothed infant needs about four times as much sun exposure as an infant in a diaper only to achieve similar 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels. So it's really not enough to just go outside and stick your wrist in the sun. You're probably not going to get too much from that. So what happens with sun... So we, we, we really have to kind of address the elephant in the room, which is sunblock and skin cancer. Obviously, all of us, even those of us who are somewhat darker skinned, as soon as we immigrate to the United States, we slather our children in sunscreen. So UVA rays are primarily important for, um, in the development of malignant melanoma, which is a huge killer, and basal cell carcinoma. There's actually less risk, contrary to popular, popular belief, of these diseases from midday sun exposure. UVB rays primarily are responsible for the aging effects of sun, so UV uh, actinic keratoses and squamous cell carcinoma. It's important to note, and if someone asks about this, we can talk about this. There are new FDA regulations about, um, about sunscreens. But for the most part, most of the sunscreens that are still on the shelves, probably through the end of this year, they absorb mainly UVB rays. And if they're properly applied, it actually reduces vitamin D3 production by 95%. So they're very efficient, even at levels as low as SPF 8. So I leave it to you all to decide what this all really means. But I will just put one economic thought in your heads, that if you believe all the other stuff I told you earlier about how much vitamin D is responsible for in terms of our overall health, then one study actually looked into this and found that of the total global burden of disease, about 0.1% is attributable to UV radiation-induced skin conditions, so about 5 to $7 billion a year, which is a lot. But vitamin D deficiency-related conditions might account for about 40 to $53 billion a year. So it's a huge difference and something to think about. So there are a lot of dietary sources of vitamin D. And I'll just point out on here, you all have this, um, if you print out the PDFs, all of this is in there. I'll just point out that the fortified dairy products all have about the same amount of vitamin D. Tofu actually has a fair amount. Um, the main dietary natural sources of vitamin D really come from fish, like salmon and uh, mushrooms that are not irradiated. But I just want to contrast this to about half of an MED of sunlight, which gives you about 3,000 units of vitamin D. 
So a word about breastfeeding and vitamin D. We all want our patients to breastfeed. Really, breast is best. But what about the vitamin D? Vitamin D is clearly much lower in breast milk than it is in fortified cow's milk or formula, which in this country is required to be fortified. So vitamin D content in breast milk averages about 22 international units per liter, or about 30 ounces, in vitamin D sufficient mother. Um, so that's not very much at all. And exclusive breastfeeding with sun exposure, without any sun exposure, would really provide only 11 to 38 international units of D per day. So really, not even close to what a growing infant needs for bone health. So how do we decide how much vitamin D is the right amount of vitamin D? I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but basically you remember from earlier that we had that compensatory mechanism where you have a relative hypocalcemia, a higher level of PTH. So when you, we, what, what's been decided is that the vitamin D level that's sufficient is probably the vitamin D level at which you have a normalized PTH. And not to belabor the point too much, but in a study of about 1,500 patients, it was found that that level at which the PTH was normalized was a vitamin D, a 25-hydroxy vitamin D level of about 31. And we'll talk now about normal ranges, and this might be why some of you on new lab reference ranges are seeing some of these higher numbers. So how do we define vitamin D deficiency? I think the latest definitions in 2011 by most experts in the field really claims that deficiency is any level under 20, that insufficiency is still an issue in the 20s range, but that may have more to do with extra skeletal health effects, and that greater than 32 is probably where most of us should be. And this is based on that earlier slide. This is really based on the level of 25-hydroxy vitamin D that we need to normalize the PTH. And that is the level at which we believe calcium uh, absorption is optimized. We do know that we prevent rickets if you have a vitamin D level greater than 11. But the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Institute of Medicine really are going based on the strongest evidence we have about prevention of bone disease rather than looking just at extraskeletal health effects. And so those classifications still maintain that 0 to 11 is a deficient state, that 11 to 20 is just mild deficiency, and that really if you're over 20, you're in a sufficient state. But I warn you that most reference ranges for most labs, including Quest and LabCorp, now refer to the latest um, greater than 32 guidelines. So what causes us to be vitamin D deficient? We've already um, talked about a number of these issues. Obviously, if you're not synthesizing very much vitamin D, so skin pigmentation can get in the way, physical blocking agents, sunscreen, clothing, or shade. Geography, so higher latitudes, winter season, air pollution, clouds, and altitude. If you're not taking in enough of those dietary sources, either fortified or natural. If you have a low serum availability, as in the patients with obesity, as we just discussed. In addition, obese patients have been found to be taking in far less in the way of dairy products and other fortified foods and maybe substituting in many more um, non-nutritive um, foods such as juice and sodas, which um, often take the place of calcium and vitamin D. Exclusive breastfeeding, especially in a mom who has low maternal stores, malabsorption syndrome, so celiac disease, cystic fibrosis, or biliary atresia, and then decreased synthesis or increased degradation of 25-hydroxy vitamin D, as in a patient with chronic liver disease or in patients who are on specific medications like glucocorticoids or other drugs like rifampin, isoniazid, or anticonvulsants. So how prevalent is vitamin D deficiency? There are at least 50 studies um, looking at the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency in a variety of settings. Um, some of the important ones demonstrated recently, for example, that over half of North American women who are receiving therapy to treat or prevent osteoporosis actually had vitamin D deficiency. This was defined based on both the less than 32 and the less than 20 criteria. 51% um, of the po a po a randomly selected population in Honolulu, Hawaii, where you'd think people would get plenty of sun, um, actually had a low vitamin D status. Um, the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency in healthy adolescents in an urban clinic was about 25%. And most recently in urban Massachusetts, about 58% of infants and 35.8% of mothers in an urban Massachusetts clinic were found to be vitamin D deficient. So it's all over the place. So what are the 2008 AAP guidelines? I found that many people are really unaware of these, and I'm not sure if they just didn't publicize them enough. All infants and children, including adolescents, should have a minimum daily intake of 400 international units of D beginning within days after birth. This is contrasted to the 2003 recommendation of 200 international units per day, which was said to start two months after birth. So it's very, very different and far more aggressive. 
And that, um, that previous guideline is now recognized as inadequate. Who should be getting 400 international units of vitamin D? Clearly, exclusively and partially breastfed infants. Formula-fed infants who are receiving less than a liter of fortified formula per day. If you think about it, most children drink less than a liter of fortified formula per day, so this really makes, means that all your patients should be on vitamin D. Um, and adolescents who are obtaining less than 400 international units of, uh, per day of vitamin D through fortified milk or foods. So especially in um, many cases we do see autistic children, for example, who are very limited in their diets. They really should be on a D supplement. Serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D level concentrations should be maintained greater than 20. That's the AAP recommendation. And children who are at increased risk of vitamin D deficiency may actually meet, need much higher doses. So should you be screening? That's always the question. Should you be getting levels on all these people? On the yes side, with the knowledge that most children and adults are vitamin D deficient or insufficient, and that this deficiency places them at high risk for chronic diseases, should everyone be tested for their blood 25D level, uh, given that vitamin D status might actually play a more important role in health than in almost any other biochemical marker? It's hard to argue with that. But on the no side, maybe we say that vitamin D deficiency and insufficiency in children and adults is widespread, so there's really no need to measure everyone's blood 25-hydroxy vitamin D level, and maybe it's far more cost-effective to actually implement a supplementation program for all children and adults until there's higher fortification of vitamin D in more foods. So who do you screen? I list here some of the people that you should screen, especially those with poor growth, malabsorption, anticonvulsant medications, frequent fractures, or those who are exclusively breastfed without supplementation. One should measure a 25-hydroxy vitamin D level and then other bone parameters. And treatment of vitamin D deficiency, I list here, this is really in your handout, but deficient patients who can take capsules should also get 50,000 international units of or ergocalciferol weekly for about eight weeks. The 25-hydroxy vitamin D level should be checked about one to two weeks after the last dose, and then they should be put on a maintenance dose. And if they have significant malabsorption, they might actually require injectable D. Simultaneous calcium supplementation is very important. We want to avoid hypocalcemia due to the hungry bone syndrome when high-dose vitamin D therapy is initiated. Um, I've given you the doses there, and in general, you reduce the dose by half and then stop the dose once the child is um, on about 400 international units per day. You monitor therapy at one month and at three months, and then following that, you just monitor 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels yearly. And one word about the forms of vitamin D. There's vitamin D2, there's vitamin D3. Vitamin D2 is ergocalciferol, D3 is cholecalciferol, and D3 is about 87% more potent in raising and maintaining the 25-hydroxy vitamin D level concentrations and may produce a two- to three-fold greater storage of vitamin D than does equimolar D2. So that's something important to keep in mind. Most fortified products in this country contain D3, and D2 is certainly fine for your vegan and vegetarian patients. How do you prevent vitamin D deficiency? We obviously need to increase our fortification of foods. Canada man mandates the fortification of designated foods. The United States just requires fortification only if the label says vitamin D fortified. So this applies to all milk products. If it doesn't say fortified, it's not. Use of supplements in children and adolescents. Obviously, we need at least 400 international units per day. Canada actually mandates 800 units per day during the winter months for breastfed infants, so it's important to keep that in mind since we're not actually that far from or different from Canada. Maternal supplementation during breastfeeding is another option. 4,000 to 6,400 units of vitamin D per day in a mom have been shown to raise 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels in infants without raising the risk of hypercalcemia. And of course, perhaps we can find a sensible, um, happy medium for sun exposure. I really can't give you any evidence-based guidelines for exactly how much, but clearly we need to find this balance. The Australian College of Dermatologists and the Cancer, Cancer Council for Australia, where we have the highest rates of malignant skin cancer in the world, have suggested that we balance sun exposure and supplementation. And so I think shortly our skin cancer societies will probably follow. Should we be worried about vitamin D excess with all these high doses I'm throwing out at you? Probably not. Hypercalcemia is really definitely associated with 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels greater than 150. Many sources caution against levels greater than 100, and many labs, as you've probably seen on the reference ranges, actually say greater than 80. 
So sunbathers and lifeguards actually achieve 25 hydroxy D levels greater than 100 without any evidence of vitamin D intoxication. Supplementation to levels greater than 100 is probably not harmful, and it's very rare that you're going to get your patient up to that level. So when should you refer to us? Obviously, patients with rickets um, and with biochemical findings of rickets, at diagnosis in most cases, um, especially if you don't have the time or the expertise to sort of explain what's going on. But clearly, if the child is at less than age six months, if there's no radiographic evidence of some healing in at least three months, and if you have a suspicion for other sort of weird genetic causes of, your, of rickets, certainly we should see them. Children who require higher dosing and a little bit more hand-holding for their dosing, and children who don't respond to adequate therapy. So my take-home points, very quickly, vitamin D has an important effect on bone and likely has considerable extraskeletal health effects. The AAP actually recommends maintaining 25 D levels above 20, but actually 32 may be the true limit for sufficiency. And the risks of UV radiation should really be balanced against the risks of def um, deficient cutaneous vitamin D synthesis, since the sun is such an efficient way of getting vitamin D. All children should be getting 400 units of vitamin D per day, and this should be initiated within days of birth. If you take nothing away from this talk, take that. Most formula-fed infants will also require vitamin D supplementation. You should screen for vitamin D levels in high-risk groups, and finally treat D-deficient patients with simultaneous vitamin D and calcium. So this is our group. My email address is on there, and I know most of you, your power has run out of your laptops, but when you look at the PDF, it's all there. So if you have any questions, and then the last slide is actually um, a whole set of references of, of really good reading so that you can read all the stuff I didn't tell you in the last half hour. Thank you.